everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Bird. I work at Akamai Technologies, and by way of introduction, um, I lead the big data architecture and the deep learning research team at Akamai. So we deal with basically all the raw data that Akamai gathers every day, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. For those of you that don't know who Akamai is, Akamai is the world's largest content delivery network. Uh, we process about 30% to 50%, depending on the day, of the internet's traffic. So most of the websites, most of the video content that you see online is being served from Akamai servers. It's about 40 terabits per second at our peak. Uh, we've had a little bit higher than that, I think, recently. We have about a quarter million servers and about 2,000 networks around the world and about 190 countries. And basically what we do is we sit very close and we cache content in real time from the origin, the original web host, down to that local machine so that the response times are as fast as possible for all the people consuming. Uh, we process about 400 petabytes of data per day, and our log data is actually about five petabytes per day. So we know a fair amount about uh, big data, as you might expect. Um, most of our major customers are people you've heard of. Facebook, most of uh, Facebook's image content is hosted on Akamai. iTunes is hosted on Akamai. Netflix and Amazon both use us pretty extensively. So the agenda today is going to be pretty straightforward. Basically, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about uh, the exascale future of today, kind of what that means, what is exascale, why we care about this, um, why is it today and not the future, really, and uh, what, what the future may hold for everybody. So just to begin, um, what is exascale computing? Well, exascale computing is really anything that involves this number, which is a quintillion. So anything bigger than a quintillion, a quintillion anything, a quintillion bytes, a quintillion operations, a quintillion bits per second on your network, uh, those are exascale computing problems. And they're the things that basically drive most of science and the large scale web services of today. So to kind of put this number in perspective, if you wanted to think about you know, what is a quintillion somethings, well, if you took every single animal, every insect, every single thing on Earth basically that lives and added it up, that's about 20 quintillion. So it kind of gives you a sense of how big that really is. That's a huge number. And uh, really, in the computing world, this has kind of been, for a long time, it's kind of been a halo problem. And the reason I call it a halo problem is because ever since about 2007, people were kind of predicting that we were going to have exascale computers within about three years. So 2007, 2008, 2009, we still don't have exascale computers today in 2015. And there's some interesting reasons why that is and why we kind of got stuck on the way. So what are the applications of exascale computing and how soon do we really need all these different things? Well, you know, when it comes to things like uh, storage, we already have that today. There are some exascale storage systems that live and exist in the world, they're functioning. Uh, compute architectures are getting pretty close and networking is really pretty far off. Um, 2025 was the most optimistic estimate that I saw, but I think the more realistic one was like 2030 or 2035 for exascale networking. And we're not talking about, by the way, individual point-to-point -point connections. We're talking about many multipath connections adding up to exascale. So some good examples of this, probably the one that most people might be familiar with, is the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is one of the largest data producers on the planet. And actually, uh, interestingly enough, they only, quote-unquote, collect 30 petabytes of data per year, but they could collect 36 exabytes of data per day if they wanted to. They just can't. There's no way to process it. There's no way to move it. Um, so they're kind of stuck. And actually, this, is, this particular project has driven a lot of research and development in exascale computing. Another good example is the square kilometer array. This is a 3,000 kilometer wide uh, radio telescope, basically, that spans Africa and South America. And uh, IBM, this project is actually so large and generates so much data that IBM is actually developing special storage arrays just for this project that are 120 petabytes apiece, which is just an astonishing amount of data when you think about it. Of course, some other big applications, really 8K video, 4K video, these things will drive exabyte scale everything, really. Um, a single raw uh, 8K video feed is actually 48 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Now, granted, we're going to compress that down. We'll come up with clever ways to get it closer to people, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be a remarkable amount of bandwidth. It's actually about 45 megapixels. And of course, the large web services are all basically exascale computers today. Uh, Akamai, Google, Yahoo, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, they're all processing data at or around this scale, depending on what you're looking at. And probably the, uh, oops, that's the wrong direction. 
probably the final one is um, Sean Connery and his exascale. Actually, uh, the intelligence communities obviously have exascale computing needs for cryptography and processing data feeds. So to cover exascale computing, we're basically going to cover three areas. We're going to talk a little bit about computer architectures themselves. We'll talk about transmission, the networking stuff that's near and dear to your hearts. And we'll talk about the storage things and some of the challenges we've learned and some of the lessons we've learned along the way and how these things have kind of grown up together. So let's start off with compute. Uh, to kind of put this in perspective, to get what they call an exaflop, which is um, a quintillion floating point operations per second out of a computer, if you wanted to do this with A8, actually this is a success. So these are uh, Cortex A9 processors, ARM processors of the iPhone 6S. You would need about a billion of these. So more iPhones than Apple's ever sold, basically, and even if they were all iPhone 6s. Um, the interesting thing is that these take about seven and a half watts of power per phone to operate at, at full tilt, or I should say per chip at full tilt. So to reach exascale, you're talking about seven and a half gigawatts of power, which is just an astonishing amount of power. If you wanted to try and do it with supercomputers, this is Tiangyi 2, this is um, the world's fastest supercomputer, which is in China currently. And this one only gets about 35 petaflops uh, peak performance. So this is actually doing it at about 18 megawatts. So you need about 30 of these, so about 500 megawatts of power if you try to do it in a supercomputing way. But obviously this is highly specialized hardware and only specialized applications can run on something like this. It's not open for general purpose computing. Uh, if you don't know this, but you're all exaflop computers. So we can all process about an exaflop of data uh, per second. Um, we don't do floating point operations, but we do something similar. Connectionist uh, computing uh, design called neuromorphic computing is kind of based on this idea. But the interesting thing about this and why we care about humans um, at all in this discussion is that we can do all this for about 20 watts of power. So as a computer scientist, you should be highly inspired by the radical efficiency of the human brain and how it does all that and why it's able to do that. And of course, that drives a lot of the future design. And actually, the most powerful computer in the world, if you want to call it that, is a single computer, is the Bitcoin network. This actually is 5.4 zettaflops of power, so way beyond exascale. Um, of course, that's a highly specialized application. It's just generating hash functions. But at the same time, it shows you that if we have a highly purpose-built kind of system for you know, calculating certain specific things, we can get kind of unlimited scale and just throw hardware at, at the problem. So the, the problem is not compute power, right? We can, we can muster an, an exaflop of compute power. The problem is how do we put it to work? How do we connect everything together? And interestingly enough, uh, the Bitcoin network is about 21,000 times faster than all the top 500 supercomputers combined. So if you took all the top 500 supercomputers that are in the top 500 list, added them all up, they're not even close to the Bitcoin network. And of course, the Bitcoin network is not just um, home computers and mining rigs, right? People have built ASIC miners. There are huge arrays of ASIC miners up in Iceland data centers. And um, it is very interesting as a, as a case study. So let's talk a little bit about the networking side of things. And obviously, this is um, probably of great interest to you folks. So exascale networking is really more of a, I would call it more of a pipe dream than a reality. Um, you know, to kind of put exascale networking into perspective, if you wanted to transmit an exabyte on a 100 gigabit ethernet network, it would take you 1,000 days. It's not even remotely plausible or tractable. You don't just move exabytes around. And actually, this is one of the major problems, is data movement is the major challenge in, in uh, exascale anything. If you were to use the Akamai network, it would take two and a half days. It's still pretty remarkable. And realize here we're talking about bisection bandwidths. We're talking about all quarter million machines just having free reign access to the internet. Um, we could move an exabyte, but it's still intractable in the sense of using it for compute purposes. It's really just too much data. Now, recently there were some folks doing uh, experimental work up in the Netherlands that basically came up with a 255 terabit per second single point-to-point -point fiber connection using a new special type of experimental fiber. Unfortunately, it only works over about two feet, but um, it's t which is not much of a network, admittedly, but it's 255 terabits, which in itself is pretty impressive because this actually approaches the theoretical limit of optical signaling period, which is about 1.2 uh, petabits per second assuming zero losses of any kind, like no Rayleigh scattering or anything. 
Now, in the supercomputing world, you know, unlike the kind of what I call the commodity or cloud space where we use Ethernet everything, basically, um, in the supercomputing world, they kind of have explored high-performance interconnections of all types for the last, you know, 20 years. And the two main players that have kind of grown out of that are obviously Gigabit Ethernet, which has been very popular with kind of the Beowulf cluster, Linux cluster crowd, and the InfiniBand uh, backbone, for those that are familiar with that. It's basically a, a parallel data interconnect that's uh, not really routed. But, you know, if we kind of continue this, this chart here actually stops in 2010. If we kind of continue that forward and look at um, sort of the evolution of those things, we can see that the major custom interconnect providers like Cray and IBM, like the BlueJean supercomputer or the Titan supercomputer that Cray has built, um, they use custom interconnects. But basically outside of that, that world, it's been this kind of dogfight between gigabit Ethernet or 10 gig or 40 gig or 100 gig Ethernet and uh, all the various flavors and pieces of InfiniBand. And InfiniBand is distinctly faster than even 100 gigabit Ethernet. Um, if you look at the, uh, this chart here, you can see this is kind of the evolution of InfiniBand over time. And even though it's not commodity, why do we care about this technology at all? Well, it's because InfiniBand's kind of, I don't want to say got its act together, but it's figured out that if you can route it, it's going to be a lot more interesting. So they're actually moving into the, what I would call the spread data center space or um, uh, the uh, nearby multi-tenancy space. And they've actually got uh, InfiniBand connections now up to almost a terabit per second aggregate bandwidth, so about uh, 500, mega, 500 gigabits per second um, in each direction. Now, this is interesting, but it, again, it doesn't get us anywhere close to exascale performance, right? It's, uh, even a terabit per second is not enough bandwidth to move what we were talking about, because if you recall, Akamai can move about 40, and that would still take us two and a half days. So maybe the most bleak part of uh, exascale computing in general is the networking side, right? This is the place where the challenges really lie, and this is the place where we're really going to feel the growth. Um, there was an interesting slide presentation given by the late CTO of AMD who basically showed that, you know, for a while we kind of moved upwards and upwards and upwards in terms of clock speeds, number of cores, and everything, and everything was just kind of rosy for about 10 years. But after that period in time, they the chip designers started finding, you know, small optimizations were about all that they could get. And in fact, they had to kind of ramp down the clock speed. They had to uh, use more cores, but they can't make the pipelines very deep. They're, they're kind of running into walls along the way. And the reason why I raise this is because at some level, we're going to have to make radically new improvements. We can't just iteratively turn the crank and make things faster. And this is actually why, you know, combined with things like the evolution of this networking type, this is actually why we haven't seen XSCL computers already. Right? If you went back to 2007, and those were sort of the rosy days of uh, the growth of computational power, you would have seen basically, or you would have anticipated, yeah, we're going to get there from here. Because you know, really every year for about 10 years up to that point, we had basically improved and followed Moore's law, not just for transistors, but also for performance scaling. We were getting about 2.8 times performance about every year with doubling of transistors. Um, that's pretty much slowed down. In fact, if you compare Sandy Bridge computers from just a couple years ago, they're really not that much slower than the current Ivy Bridge or more recent cores from, uh, from Intel. They've made some improvements, but they're not radical. So let's touch on the storage side for just a minute. And basically storage, you know, this is, this is kind of a happier picture. <laughs> Maybe this is a good thing. Um, exascale storage is here today. I mean, you can use an exascale, an exascale storage system today. In fact, you do every time you search Google. Uh, they have about 10 exabytes of nearline storage and about 5 exabytes of tape storage. At least that was an estimate that was provided. Um, Akamai's net storage system, this is a big object uh, storage system. This has about an exabyte of storage for object storage purposes. And actually, a number of our largest customers use this to store their back-end content. But, you know, that being said, this is kind of a classic problem, right? We always need more. There's no, no one's ever happy with the storage that they have. I mean, they might be happy for a while, but soon they'll fill that up. The content gets richer. They end up logging more data. Um, you, want, you decide you want to try a PCAP on a 100 gigabit Ethernet connection, you're going to have to put that stuff somewhere, and it's going to have to be usable once it gets there. So if you think about the LHC, right, this is a, this is a great example of this. They, they could store 36 exabytes of data every day, but they don't. They store 30 petabytes a year total because that's what they can move in the year 
between all the different data centers and crunch in that time period. So as the compute power grows, that's great, but they can definitely fill the gap. You know, the, they can provide that compute system with as much, as much raw data as they want to, basically. Um, if you think about the square kilometer array, it's about, a, about an exabyte and a half a year, at least that's what they're anticipating, but that's just to start. They haven't even fired the thing up yet, really. And for Akamai, just our log data is over five petabytes, or sorry, over two exabytes a year, which is about five petabytes per day or so, um, and growing. In fact, I started Akamai about a year and a half ago, and when I started, it was at three, three petabytes per day, right? And I started there, and I just couldn't believe it. And we're talking about raw log text files. Like, imagine just Apache logs for days. I mean, they're not, they're not Apache, but it's a similar thing. In storage, you know, locality is really the hard problem. Right? And it's not just locality to where it's being stored or, or what's generating the, the core data, but it's also based on who's going to consume it and the processes that are consume it. And more importantly, it's not like you can put it all on one hard drive. Right? So if you think about having, say, thousands of data centers around the planet and you've got uh, all of this raw data, you're not going to crunch it all in one data center. You, you can't move it all back to one place or shift it over there or do some other thing. You have to basically think about the entire compute problem from end to end. We have to get the storage essentially co-resident with all the compute. And we have to think of better ways to do uh, compute in flight. So when you're dealing with streaming data, like many folks are, they're, you know, the traditional definition of streaming data is that you're just going to do some some in situ analytics as it passes you by, and you're just going to throw the rest away. Well, that's not really reality. In reality, most people are archiving some of that streaming data and saving it. Um, and we need to figure out how to actually store things along the path. So there's a significant kind of evolution of thinking here, which falls in line with uh, things like software defined networking and uh, network coding that basically tries to take advantage of physical placement and the amount of popularity that a certain piece of content has to try and improve its compute power. So, you know, the interesting thing about Hadoop and kind of the evolution of that entire line of. Uh, of software is that HDFS really showed us that large scale kind of bulk raw storage is pretty cheap and it's pretty easy to do. And it can be made pretty useful, but it did reveal a bunch of challenges, right? Um, probably the first thing, which is a little bit odd, is that suddenly the on disk formats are the central point of discussion for everything that you do with big data, right? If you if you're trying to, um, you know, the, the basic tenet of big data is we're not going to do anything with our data when we store it, we're just going to store all the raw data and we'll decide later how we want to uh, transform and load that data as we decide to analyze it. Well, when you're talking about enormous quantities of data, the efficiency with which you can read things from disk, obviously which is accelerated by things like SSDs, um, is important, but ultimately speaking, it's not the thing that matters most. The thing that matters most is really something as simple as how the file is actually written, right? The order in which you write things. So do you structure your data in kind of a, a row-oriented way? Is it more of a column-oriented store? And those things really matter because you can't just go back and change it, right? If you have five exabytes of data stored somewhere and it's all set up basically for rows and columns and you decide that you need pre-calculated cubes out of your data, you're going to have to go recalculate that over the entire five exabytes and rewrite it to disk. That's a lot of data, right? So you're kind of fortune telling with big data and that's a little disconcerting, I think, to most people. And really, I mean, this kind of speaks to the more core problem, which is how do we balance this read-write efficiency uh, that you gain? I mean, obviously, you gain great write efficiency with things like Hadoop because you're not doing anything to the data. You're just writing it in parallel as fast as you can. That's great. But I need to be able to read it, efficiency, uh, read it efficiently as well. So we kind of have to balance these problems around. And of course, if I want to uh, create special or carve out, I should say, special clusters to, to crunch this data, we get right back to this data movement problem that we talked about before. The other problem is really scaling multi-tenancy, right? Uh, multi-tenancy, you know, there have been kind of two, two approaches to this problem, and they came from what I would call radically different worlds. There was the data center-minded approach, which was we've got one data center, and we want to have, say, an emergency data center over here, and so we will replicate that data. And it was considered very much replication. We were going to copy all that data over to this other data center. We might write it in parallel even. But at the end of the day, we're not really thinking much further than just a few data centers. 
At the opposite end of the spectrum were P2P networks, which said, we have no data centers whatsoever. We just have random garbage machines out on the internet. We need to get redundancy out of the software, not out of the hardware, because we can't depend on the hardware whatsoever. Now, on the surface, that sounds like, wow, that's a perfect solution to the problem. Let's just do all P2P. But clearly, that ignores the major gains that you get from you know, just raw performance from being in a data center. So we have to kind of rethink how we're going to handle multi-tenancy in the future. And it's not so much multi-tenancy anymore as it is survivability, is kind of the way that I would describe it. So you know, really what we're talking about here is how do we make the planet act like a giant cache? Um, you know, if you think about your processor, your processor has an L1 cache, it has an L2 cache, may have an L3 cache, depending upon what it is. And then you've got your main memory and you've got your local hard drive. Well, if you just keep carrying that up, um, you can think about the internet itself and the rest of your data centers, the rest of your multi-tenant space as a cache, right? And so, for example, uh, uh, Andrew N from Baidu, who um, he's the chief scientist there, but he also teaches at Stanford, teaches their machine learning courses. Um, he's talked about basically how they've kind of rethought at Baidu the entire concept of caching, right? Trying to make the layers work more synergistically together instead of just trying to speed up one part of it. So rather than just trying to make the disks faster, trying to make the disks feed the memory preemptively, basically, how do we use prediction, how do we use advanced methods to decide in advance based on popularity or based on other factors? How do we decide in advance what to put in RAM before the computer even knows it needs it? That's a very different mindset from the way we have currently, and it's really only one that you can do when you can afford to be wrong, right? So that means you've got to have extra capacity that you can kind of throw away in case you were wrong, but you hope that you can do better than wrong, basically. So uh, this last one is, I think, probably the most important and maybe the, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is basically that how do we actually put the data to work, right? Databases are much harder than just storage. So building up, you know, building Spanner, as an example, the uh, Google database, is a significantly more complicated task than setting up an HDFS system. Um, and this speaks a lot to that ETL problem that we talked about earlier, that transform and load problem. What do we do with the data? How do we present it? How do we make it accessible to large groups of users who have totally different workloads, right? Some, some people, like let's say um, inside Akamai, we have huge data systems, huge database systems, but the workloads are radically different from person to person. Some developers are just exploring. Other people are building production applications. Um, you've got workload prioritization that has to factor in there. You've got query planning that has to be done over many large distributed systems. And for those that have not uh, had to work with database design before, basically query planning is solving a graph problem. It's solving the Hamiltonian over all the costs of all the different types of data in your database. So when you issue a query, if you want it to respond instantly, it basically has to have pre-computed that entire query plan. It has to know what you're going to be doing. Well, if you've got thousands of users, or in the case of, like, say, Google or large web services, hundreds of millions or billions of users, you have to really treat this as more of a statistical problem. It's not so much a hard engineering and architecture problem. It becomes more of a, almost more of a machine learning problem or a statistics problem. And these applications are also everywhere, right? They live everywhere. So a consumer, you know, someone could be a heavy user of a database in a specific type. Um, then they go to China, and they have to use it in that way from China. And then they go back home, and they've got to use it from that way over here. And we have you know, this concept of constantly mobile users and kind of the uh, inequality of different types of queries or different types of content delivery um, really affect how you can move things around. And at the moment, systems are simply not set up to do any of this. They don't anticipate, like Spanner doesn't anticipate, you know, based on my location, that now I'm going to be in... China, and so because I'm in China, it should move all my frequent searches to machines resident on the, on the Chinese C, uh, CDN. These are the things we have to do as we optimize. <coughs> so what are the lessons learned from all this? You know, this is where I guess maybe the rubber meets the road, because we're not there yet, and we're not just going to get there by doing something else. This is not exactly a rosy talk in that sense. It's more of a realistic talk on the hard engineering problems that are in front of us. And so I would say that probably first and foremost, the biggest problem is efficiency, right? Then I mean, by this, I mean power efficiency, transit efficiency, uh, disk efficiency, cache efficiency, everything that we can possibly squeeze out of these systems matters. 
This is actually leading to new types of compute architectures. So for example, we see neuromorphic computing, which is a non-von Neumann architecture, uh, more of a connectionist architecture. We, we see quantum computing coming up. And actually, people have asked me before, you know, isn't quantum computing just going to like solve these problems? Actually, quantum computing is probably not going to solve any of these problems. In fact, quantum computing is so specialized. If you look at where it's at, um, the number of qubits that are required to do things like calculate Shor's algorithm is in the 500,000 range. We're just nowhere near the stage where quantum computing is going to impact us in the next couple years. The next one is cooling, right? This is obviously near and dear to everybody that's involved in data center design. But when we think of cooling, we think of you know, more efficient ducting, you know, it looks prettier, it's got, it's got you know, radius bends, all these different things. But that's not what we're talking about in the exascale world. Here we're talking about immersion-cooled systems that use passive heat exchange, they're completely different approaches where power density can approach, you know, 200 kilowatts or a megawatt per rack. It's a completely different design. And when you think about um, the problems of immersion cooling, immersion cooling is not done with vertical racks. It's done with floor-based racks where you lay the blades in vertically like this. That's a completely different floor plan than you're even talking about in a traditional data center. So this brings with itself it's uh, a whole host of problems. Adjacency. Uh, this is kind of the problem that Akamai's been solving from the very beginning. You know, if uh, when you go back to the origins of Akamai, which is in the, the mid to late 90s, there were basically some guys from MIT that said, you know, there's got to be a more efficient way to try and distribute content. Well, one of the most obvious ways is just get closer to the person, right? So at the surface, that was a very simple problem. Over the years, we've come to understand that basically adjacency means having a massive global cache hierarchy. How do you scale that? How do you get close to the person? Especially when they're mobile. What does that really mean? And finally, development. Um, for anyone that's, has anyone ever done any development for like MPI or supercomputer type systems before or anything like that? Okay. So if, if you ever get into that, you'll find out very quickly that it is nothing like developing for a traditional application. It's entirely message passing, um, which nowadays is pretty commonplace in regular applications, but They've been doing that for 20 years in the supercomputing world. That's old hat. Um, but as we scale into exascale systems, it becomes even more difficult, right? We have to figure out ways to make tools and these systems accessible to developers. You can't depend on a developer, say, in the future, carefully constructing a query plan or carefully constructing a set of queries such that it's, it just barely fits into the performance you know, um, gaps that you have. Basically, we have to abstract all that away. You know, if something is powered entirely by deep learning, it's not going to be controllable by the end user, right? It's been trained based on the data that it's seen, and that's a completely different mindset for developers. Not to mention if you're trying to program quantum computers or neuromorphic systems, they again have completely different programming models. They're not even remotely similar. Even GPU programming is nothing like regular programming. So when you think about the largest supercomputers in the world or the most powerful systems, they're really large, nowadays they're really largely composed of GPUs. So for example, um, if you take Titan, which is the second fastest supercomputer in the world, um, that's a, a Cray machine. It's basically half CPUs and half GPUs. And the CPUs are really just there to kind of feed data to the GPUs. That's all that they really do. But when you write code for this, you're now thinking completely differently about how you construct parallel execution. Uh, it's not the same thing as just developing a straightforward procedural application or even an object-oriented one. So, you know, I think maybe the most important thing is that up until pretty recently, in fact, the mindset in the high performance world was that it's kind of supercomputers versus cloud, right? So like Google and Akamai and Facebook were over here and we're building all of our stuff. And the supercomputing community was over here building all their stuff. And those two camps did not talk to each other. We didn't go to the same conferences. We didn't communicate whatsoever. Um, but in the last few years, it's kind of become supercomputers and cloud computers. They both cross-pollinated. In fact, there's a very famous researcher. He was involved with the first uh, browser at University of Illinois. But basically, he left academia, went to industry, and thought to himself, I'm going to bring all my experience from the supercomputing world, and I'm going to teach these big data people how it's done. And uh, in an interview that he, he was just awarded the ACM fellow, uh, in his interview for that, he said, after a couple of years, I went back to academia because I realized that we were not cross-pollinating that information whatsoever. And in fact, there were a lot of really valuable lessons that the supercomputing world could learn from the cloud computing world and vice versa. So let's talk about some of those lessons. You know, from supercomputing, the first thing is power efficiency is king, right? If you wanted to do uh, 
you know, it takes about a million dollars a month to provide a, a megawatt to a, a supercomputer based on its load. So in order to reach exascale today, we're talking about $500 million a month in power, right? That's an extraordinarily large problem. If you, if you, I mean, just ignoring all the wiring and cabling problems there, um, just to get that power feed is very difficult. The brain only needs 20 to be exascale. So there's something kind of implicitly disappointing about the solution that we're coming up with when the brain, like, you know, we have hundreds of exaflops of power in this room, right? And it's not hot, and we don't need to be immersion cooled or anything else. We need to figure out how to breach that gap. And actually, they're discovering that it's kind of going backwards, right? The human brain actually has a very low clock speed. It's only about, about 10 hertz. Um, but it still can calculate. It's the most extraordinary pattern recognition machine in the world. In fact, all of DARPA's new high-performance benchmarks are actually based on pattern recognition, not traditional matrix factorization uh, uh, definitions. And it's done for this reason. From supercomputers, we can learn to be a lot more open to alternative compute architectures, right? We're very used to CPUs in the data center world. Um, but in the supercomputer world, they experiment with ARMs, GPUs, huge FPGA arrays, ASICs for custom applications. That's something that's going to change. In fact, I, you know, if, you see, if you follow some of the Intel uh, server-side processor stuff, you'll note that they are talking about incorporating FPGA, a small FPGA, into the chip, specifically for this purpose, right? And so now developers are going to have to learn how to program FPGAs. And they, again, are programmed nothing like a standard CPU. They've also learned that the hierarchies of different high-performance networking techs are a necessary evil, and you need them. Um, we haven't quite crossed that gap in the cloud world yet. You'll, it's incredibly rare to find anyone that's implementing InfiniBand for anything. Um, and that's really something that's going to have to change. And plus, uh, this idea of non-von Neumann architectures, using neuromorphic systems, these kind of connectionist compute systems, and what I would call lossy computing, uh, systems that don't have to be right all the time. It turns out that you can make a processor that's dramatically faster most of the time, as long as you can accept it being wrong periodically. Now, I'm not sure humans are ready for that, but uh, especially programmers, because um, obviously it complicates the, uh, <laughs> the uh, debugging problem. But the real thing here is that we just have to get our brain around it, right? We have to get our brain around the idea that if we want to really crack through, I mean, forget exascale. Let's think about zeta scale or yada scale computing. If we really want to get into the origin of the universe type computing problems, we're going to have to be able to handle this. Now, from the cloud world, we've learned that really new software architectures can transform things dramatically. You know, there was kind of a weird stagnancy in the supercomputing community. Um, and in the cloud world, we think about the software as everything. And I think that's because we grew up on basically commodity hardware. We were trying to make something fast out of something slow. And so we figured out really clever ways to distribute load and clever ways to split up files and get parallelism. Um, and the idea of using kind of large-scale planetary, or what I would call planetary-scale cache, basically to uh, provide you with storage, anticipatory storage that can scale up to these large problems. The cloud world focuses on bisection bandwidth as opposed to data center bandwidth. And I think this is a healthy lesson because it's, it's actually served the P2P world pretty well. And I think in this way, actually, clouds have kind of intersected with P2P. Clouds are really all about uh, moving data to where it's useful, but this is the hardest problem, right? So, you know, it's not easy to anticipate where someone's going to surf the web next or what they're going to want to look at next. And when you think about new dynamic content, this is always changing. Putting data to work is really the second hardest problem. And actually, uh, recently, Michael Stonebreaker, who uh, is the Turing Award winner, um, pretty much invented every major high-performance database in the last 20 years. Uh, Michael Stonebreaker basically said, <laughs> just last month, that polystore is what he calls a polystore is really the thing we have to have. And this is basically a database that stores data in row form, column form, cubes, graphs, and everything at the same time, and uses engines, individual engines for each of those tasks, and then interprets queries to execute the query in the most optimal fashion across all these different potential engines. That's a very difficult problem. That's a much more difficult problem. If you think about the semantics of like blending full text search with a SQL query, that's a, that's a tough thing to do. We haven't made that uh, semantic gap yet, that semantic leap. Then from P2P networks, basically, um, we found that, you know, as, as Bitcoin has, has shown that Basically, we can build specialized networks that can solve some problems with ridiculous speed, but for the most part, they're really good for their bisection bandwidth. 
And obviously, swarm computing like BitTorrent and SDN combined with things like BitTorrent can lead to some really interesting results. So I think there's a lot of uh, legs to go there. So the key takeaways here is that we're, we're almost there, but we've been almost there for about seven, eight years now. Um, Exascale is really not just for scientific applications. Obviously, we've seen it can be used for the web. Cross-industry collaboration is key to this. In fact, you're seeing this a lot more. You're seeing Google partner with academia, partnering with the intelligence agencies, not on distributing data, but on computing large things, period. And fundamentally, we're going to change how we compute and develop. You know, to reach exascale, I don't think we have to go to like neuromorphic uh, machines. But to get much farther beyond that, you know, even to get to 10 exabytes or 100 exabytes, um, or exaflops, I should say, uh, we're going to have to make some radical shifts in how we develop applications, how we debug applications, the tools that, uh, that we use, and the assumptions that we make of the developer. Right? The idea of always being a low-level C developer, you can pretty much forget it. In a large-scale distributed world, maybe once the systems are built, but for the day-to-day -day applications that are built, it's going to be incredibly hard to think, quote, in the machine, because there isn't in the machine anymore. It's all in the cloud, and it's highly dynamic, and it's moving. So in with that, we have Q&A.